Well, good afternoon, everybody, and I'm delighted to be here with you in Enniskillen today. Uh, the book um, is focused primarily on the recent conflict and every conflict-related death that occurred in the county between 71 and 94 is detailed. But in order to provide context and background for it, the book makes a whistle-stop tour through the centuries, beginning with the Ulster Plantation, and it explores how from the early 17th century to the signing of the Good Friday Agreement in 1998, central and local government policies and decisions have impacted on the two principal communities of County Fermanagh. So Fermanagh County Museum has kindly invited me to speak today on the decade 1912-22 to 22 to coincide with their changing of a nation exhibition. <clears throat> the decade decisively shaped our island for the next 100 years and uh, as it remains today. And I will discuss the effect of this turbulent and transformative period on Fermanagh, beginning with the Home Rule Bill of 1912, which gave rise to the Ulster Covenant, the founding of the Ulster Volunteer Force and the Irish Volunteers. And at the other end, I'm going to continue a little beyond uh, 1922. I'm going to go to the end of 1925 because I think the, uh, the Boundary Commission was very, very important and the outcome of it. From the beginning of the 20th century, Fermanagh had become more segregated. On the nationalist side, the county had become exposed to the GAA and the Gaelic League. And the county's first GAA club had been founded in Newtown Butler in 1887. By 1911, the Irish language was being taught in all Catholic schools in the county. These expressions of Gaelic culture created new divisions with their Protestant neighbours. So when the third Home Rule Bill was introduced in Westminster by the Liberal government on the 11th of April 1912, despite the limited amount of power it offered to a devolved government in Ireland, it provoked such a hysterical reaction from Unionists that it brought Ireland to the brink of civil war. Two days before the bill was even introduced, the new Conservative Party leader, Andrew Boner Law, uh, came from London to accompany Edward Carson and they reviewed a march at Balmoral in Belfast of 100,000 opponents of the bill. Carson, who was leader of the Unionist Party, made a whirlwind tour of Ulster to whip up opposition against Home Rule and he began his tour here in Enniskillen on the 18th of September. A troop of horse specially trained by William Copeland Trimble, the owner of the impartial reporter newspaper, met him at Castle Cool and led him and the Earl of Earn to the town hall. It was said to be the biggest public demonstration ever in Enniskillen, and Carson was the first to sign the Ulster Covenant at Belfast City Hall ten days later on the 28th of September. Unionist clubs had been set up in 1893 at the time of the second Home Rule Bill. These clubs now were re-energised and new ones were inaugurated. A meeting of the Fermanagh Unionist Clubs was held at Crum Castle, the Earl of Erne's estate, in January. And uh, the, at this uh, meeting, the formation of a volunteer force to oppose Home Rule was discussed. And while that meeting was going on, there were about 70 local farmers drilling outside on the estate. The UVF, the Ulster Volunteer Force, was established that same month, January 1913. It grew mainly out of the Orange Order and the Unionist Clubs, and there were five county representatives for Fermanagh, Edward Mervyn Archdale of Ballina Mallard, John Porter Porter of Belle Isle Lisbelaw, Major Viscount Crichton of Earl of Erne from Crum Castle, C.F. Falls from Enniskillen and the Reverend W.B. Stack 
of our desk, who was the county secretary. In July 1913, the Reverend Stack was identified as a prime mover in the importation of arms into Fermanagh. The local, or the local RIC county inspector reported as follows. He said, uh, at a secret meeting of five delegates of the UVF held at Florence Court, and that's the Earl of Erne's estate, or the Earl of Enniskillen's estate, the Reverend Mr. Stack is said to have stated that a number of arms have been received into the county via Bondoran and Ballyshannon and brought up to Kesh and Irvinstown by small boats. By mid-1914, almost 3,000 Fermanagh men had joined the UVF and the whole force was commanded by the Earl of Erne until his unexpected death in December. On the national side, there was a growing concern that it was necessary to form a counter-organisation to the UVF. And one of the first battalions of the Irish Volunteers was formed in Fermanagh in 1914. According to historian Brian Barton, Fermanagh was more sharply divided on grounds of religion and politics than ever before in its history in the year before World War I broke out. Fears were rising in both communities. For the Unionist community, the date for the introduction of Home Rule was fast approaching. And for the Nationalist community, there was awareness that partition was being canvassed at Westminster as a possible solution to the Home Rule question. So then, when the First World War broke out, in 1914, all these tensions eased and the pressing problems at home were shelved. Home rule was deferred until the end of the war. 200 Fermanagh members of the UVF and the Redmondite National Volunteers immediately enlisted in the British Army, while the remaining Irish Volunteers who disagreed with Redmond chose not to do so. Altogether, 13 battalions of the Royal and Skilling Fusiliers and Dragoons took part in the war, including members of both communities. Now, I'm not going to go into great detail about the, the First World War, but I'll just deal with in terms of loss of life of Fermanagh men in World War I. An American historian, J Jason Myers, has carried out painstaking research on all Irish men killed. And as a percentage of the male population of Fermanagh, aged between 15 and 54 in the 1911 census, he estimates that the loss was 3.1%. And uh, you can see Fermanagh right over here on the right hand side. This compares to County Down, uh, third from the right which lost 4%, then Derry, 3.8%, uh, Armagh, 37 Dublin, 3.8%, Antrim, 34 and Carlow, 32 and then you would Fermanagh with 31 So Fermanagh suffered the seventh highest loss of any county in Ireland. All other counties lost less than 3% of their male population within this age range. The figures, uh, just two of the people included in these figures, uh, the son and heir of the Earl of Erne, Henry Crichton, who was killed on the 31st of October 1914, dying just two months before his father, and Jack Carruthers, a young man of whom I will speak more shortly. Just moving on then to the Easter Rising against British rule in Ireland, which began on Easter Monday, the 24th of April 1916, when the Irish Republican Brotherhood and the Irish Citizen Army seized key positions in Dublin and from their headquarters in the GPO declared a republic. At least 12 Fermanagh men fought with the rebels. Three of the 12 were Protestants, George Irvine, 
William Scott and a man called Wilson, whose first name I do not know. George Irvine from East Bridge Street, Enniskillen, was the most prominent of the three. He was a member of the Church of Ireland and had been educated at Portora Royal School. He trained as a teacher and at the turn of the century he moved to Dublin to take up a teaching post in the Church of Ireland School in Rath Mines. He joined the Gaelic League in 1905 and became an ardent advocate of the Irish language. Two years later, he joined the Irish Republican Brotherhood. During the Rising, he fought in the South Dublin Union under Eamon Kant. He was sentenced to death, but had his sentence commuted to 10 years in prison. Like the other prisoners, he was released in 1917 and was chaired through the streets of Enniskillen. He attended a service in the Church of Ireland, now the Cathedral, in his volunteer's uniform and refused to stand for the British National Anthem during the service. <clears throat> he fought on the Republican side in the Civil War. He died in June 1954 and is buried in Mount Jerome Cemetery in Dublin. And I uh, understand that uh, the County Museum here recently acquired a Christmas card designed by him. Uh, William John Scott was also a member of the Church of Ireland and in later years he joined the Plymouth Brethren. He was a bricklayer and a strong trade unionist. At the time of the rising he was unemployed and lived in the Dublin tenements. He was a member of James Connolly's Irish Citizen Army and fought under Constance Markovich and Michael Mallon in St Stephen's Green. <coughs> He too fought on the Republican side in the Civil War, <clears throat> along with his son Alexander. Another son, Bill, joined the International Brigades and fought against Franco in Spain. William died in 1947 and is also buried in Mount Jerome Cemetery. The man called Wilson was a native of Enniskillen. He reportedly kept a boot shop in East Bridge Street, but when his shop was burned, he lost everything and moved to Dublin. Three Derry Gonnelly men fought in the Rising, Patrick Maguire, Joe Duffy, and a man, again, whose first name we do not know, called Meehan. Patrick Maguire was born in 1889, emigrated to Glasgow, and uh, in early 1916 he crossed to Dublin and joined the IRB's Kimmage, Kimmage Garrison. He fought in the GPO where he remained all week. After the surrender, he was interned in Frongoch and was released at Christmas 1916 and returned to Glasgow. He became involved in the procurement of arms during the War of Independence and remained a Republican for the rest of his life. He died in 1970 and was buried in Glasgow, having been accorded a Republican funeral. Joe Duffy was also a member of the Kimmage Garrison so he probably also fought in the GPO. John Joseph Scollin, a native of South Shields, whose parents were both from Enniskillen, served as a captain in the GPO. He had previously moved to Enniskillen and worked for a time in the Impartial Reporter. He died in 1963, and he too was buried in Mount Jerome Cemetery. Owen Green from Mulladon was in business in Dublin. He fought in Boland's Mill and was wounded. He later owned a farm and a drapery shop in Kinlock, County Leitrim, where he was buried. Phil Cassidy from Letter Breen also fought in the GPO. He was in business in Dublin and he died in 1938 and is buried in Army Cemetery. Other men who took part were Michael Love, who fought in Jacob's Biscuit Factory, and brothers Romy and Conway McGinn, first cousins of Michael Love. Now I've only been able to find one young Fermanagh man who fought in the British side in the Easter Rising, and this occurred really by accident. I mentioned his name there earlier. Jack Carruthers from Tamla, like George Irvine, was a former pupil of Portora Royal School. He joined the British Army in 1915 and was on his way home on holiday through Dublin on Easter Monday, just as the Rising was beginning. 
He was holed up in Ship Street barracks most of the week and was involved in only one shooting incident. He and some of his comrades fired at two snipers on Thursday the 28th of April, killing one of them and wounding the other. However, Jack did not survive for long as he was killed on the battlefields of France in August 1917. So then we come to the aftermath and the fears of the Irish Parliamentary Party that um, Home Rule, after the 1916 Rising, that Home Rule would not be introduced. So it's the, the Nationalist Convention, which later became known as the Black Friday Convention. I know Black Friday has different connotations now. Uh, but uh, after the Rising and the executions, the mass arrests and martial law, John Redmond was fearful that Home Rule would never be implemented. So a Nationalist Convention was organised and held in Belfast on the 23rd of June 1916, which was attended by around 750 Nationalist delegates from the six counties which were at the time being proposed to be exempted from Home Rule. John Redmond, the MP for Waterford City, John Dillon for East Mayo, and Joseph Devlin, at the time uh, MP for Kilkenny North, addressed the convention. Crucially, Redmond had been assured by Lloyd George that this exemption of the six counties would be a temporary measure. However, by sleight of hand, Lloyd George had separately assured Carson that the scheme would be permanent and enduring. Redmond warned the delegates that if they rejected the scheme, home rule would be lost. He was attacked by an array of anti-partitionist speakers led by F.J. O'Connor, a NOMA solicitor and a powerful orator. After five hours of bitter argument, Redmond threatened to resign. In the end, a majority of 475 to 265 voted to swallow the bitter pill. Afterwards, however, there were claims that the convention had been packed with Devlin's Hibernians. The ancient order of Hibernians was Devlin's own party machine, and he had mobilised all its influence to secure victory at the Black Friday Convention. He was actually the Grand Master of the Ancient Order of um, Hibernians at the time. <clears throat> the Fermanagh delegates opposed the plan, and in particular the exclusion of Fermanagh and Tyrone from Home Rule, and they voted against the scheme. The convention generated a fatal split in the Irish Parliamentary Party and helped to dictate the final shape of partition. Now, the general election of 1918 saw an overwhelming defeat of the IPP and a landslide victory for Sinn Féin. In the six Ulster counties, which would form the future Northern Ireland, Unionists, however, won 23 of the 30 seats. In South Fermanagh, Sinn Féin won a seat with a majority of 2,281 votes, but they narrowly lost the North Fermanagh seat to Unionist Edward Mervyn Archdale by 532 votes. Thereby, Nationalists had secured an overall majority of 1,749 votes. The Government of Ireland Act Ahead of the passage of the Government of Ireland Act, uh, Ulster Unionists, led by James Craig, lobbied heavily to steer the British government away from recommending a nine-county Northern Ireland. The Unionists were fearful that the Northern Parliament would be unable to govern in areas where there was a nationalist majority and greatly preferred that the scheme should be limited to the six so-called Protestant counties. The British government appointed a cabinet committee to draw up a new Home Rule Bill for Ireland, which was chaired by Walter Long, the former Ulster Unionist Party leader. He had been leader from 1906 to 1910. 
The other members were Ian McPherson, Chief Secretary, and John French, Lord Lieutenant of Ireland. The committee proposed the creation of two Irish Home Rule entities, Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland, and the Government of Ireland Act was passed into law in November 1920. Of the so-called Protestant counties, there were Catholic majorities in the city of Derry and in Fermanagh and Tyrone. One third of the population was nationalist, as was half of its territory. Although the British government favoured the nine county option in order to maintain a religious balance, under pressure from unionists, they agreed to legislate for the six county option. The legislation saw unionists abandon their co-religionists in Donegal, Cavan and Monaghan in the rationalisation that a six county state was the maximum territory they could control. The 70,000 Protestants of these three counties regarded Carson's and Craig's acceptance of a six county northern state as the ultimate betrayal. During the Home Rule crisis, recruitment into the UVF had been higher in these three counties than in Antrim Down or Belfast relative to population. The aim of the abandoned southern Protestants thereafter was to make the best of their lot and secure the most advantageous deal possible in the new free state. Partition's major victims, however, were the nationalists, who suddenly found themselves in a minority within the new Northern Ireland, comprising just over a third of its population. Elections were held in both parts of Ireland in May 1921. In Northern, Ireland, um, in Northern Ireland, 40 Unionists and only 12 Sinn Féin and Nationalist Party members were returned. This was a huge disappointment for Sinn Féin, who had expected to win more than a third of the seats. It is clear that Unionists turned out in massive numbers. In Belfast, their turnout was a remarkable 92% and the overall turnout was actually 88%. Sinn Féin and the Nationalist Party did have a significant victory in Fermanagh, Tyrone. The two counties had been joined to form one eight-seat constituency. Four Unionists, three Sinn Féin and one Nationalist were elected. The total Unionist vote came to nearly 38,000, while the Nationalist vote was 45,760, a majority of 7,800, or 54.7%. The Nationalists of Fermanagh and Tyrone therefore believed that their wish to be included under a Dublin Parliament must be respected, and so their successful Sinn Féin candidates took their seats in Doyle Aaron. James Craig moved quickly to introduce local government changes that removed proportional representation and reconfigured council areas in anticipation of a boundary commission being established. <clears throat> he was determined to maximise unionist representation in border areas and especially to subvert the nationalist claim of controlling Fermanagh and Tyrone County Councils. Now we move on to the War of Independence in Fermanagh. Now I'm not going to cover obviously all of it, I'm just going to uh, deal with the major, the major attacks that occurred during that time. Sir Basil Brooke set up Fermanagh Vigilance, a vigilante group in April 1920 to provide defence against incursions by the IRA. This militia, along with others in Antrim and Belfast, was uh, incorporated into the Ulster Special Constabulary, which UVF members joined en masse. Basildbrook boasted that Fermanagh had the highest percentage of loyalists in the Special Police in any, counts, in any county in Ulster. Men were also recruited from Orange Lodges. 
The Ulster Special Constabulary, mainly the B Specials, like the UDR decades later, were the most visible security agents of the state in rural areas, which was obviously very polarising for the community. On the 21st of February 1921, the village of Ross Lay was attacked and practically razed as Catholic-owned property was looted and burned by B-Specials. The attack was a reprisal for the attempted murder of Constable George Lester as he opened his shop in the village that morning. On that night, B-Specials and UVF men descended on Ross Lay, attacking the parochial house and burning ten Catholic-owned homes. The roads out of Ross Lay uh, were filled with people carrying their possessions and uh, as they fled the flames that were engulfing the village. The historian Edward Burke claims that a loyalist militia from Crum Castle, the domain of the Earl of Erne, were also involved in this attack. One person was killed, a UVF man named Finnegan, who was shot when he was using the butt of his rifle to break down a door. The rifle discharged, killing him. Retaliation by the IRA came exactly one month later. Organised attacks on the homes of B-Specials in the Rossley area were carried out on the 21st of March, when two were shot dead and others were wounded. The two men killed were William Gordon of Rathkeven and Samuel Nixon of Tatty Moor. Gordon was caretaker on the Madden property at Springgrove, while Nixon was a farmer. Three houses were burned, while many others were wrecked. Then an ambush took place on the 29th of May, when Monaghan IRA attacked a 12-man patrol of B-Specials at Mullafad Cross, near the fermanagh Monaghan border, which resulted in the deaths of two constables, <clears throat> Robert Coulter and James Hall, and the wounding of Constable John Montgomery. Now, after the signing of the treaty in December 1921, feelings ran high along the border. On the 21st of January 1922, the Ulster Gaelic football final between Monaghan and Derry was due to be played in Derry. On the previous evening, six carloads left Monaghan to transport the team. Many of the team and those accompanying them were members of the IRA and were carrying revolvers. Some of the entourage were in reality on a reconnaissance mission aimed at releasing three men imprisoned in Derry Jail who were due to be hanged on the 9th of February. They were stopped by a group of B-Specials en route and when it was discovered that they were armed, ten men were arrested. One of the men was Dan Hogan. <clears throat> Dan Hogan, who was the officer commanding the 5th Northern Division, whose brother, Tipperary Hurler, Michael Hogan, was shot dead in Croke Park on Bloody Sunday, the 21st of November 1920. And the Hogan stand in Croke Park is named after Michael Hogan. But the arrested men were brought to Oma and were interned then in Derry shortly afterwards. After their arrests, the IRA raided in large numbers across the brand new border into South Tyrone and the Enniskillen area. Local communications were cut, properties were burnt and over 40 local unionists were kidnapped and taken back across the border. The local situation became very tense. In response to the kidnappings, Specials poured into the border areas, blowing up bridges and blocking roads, and both sides exchanged fire. And then we come to the clonus of Frey, as it was known. It was against this backdrop that the ill-fated train rolled into Clonus on the 11th of February 1922. It was en route from Belfast to Enniskillen via Clonus, now, they could have taken an alternative route from Belfast via Portadown, Dungannon, Oma, Bondoran Junction to Enniskillen. But this was, this was the usual route, probably. <clears throat> now, there would have been bad feeling in Clonus at the time towards the specials, because in December 1920, 
some specials from Newton Butler had been looting and raiding houses and businesses there and then the, RI, the RIC caught them and suspended them. But the specials on the day were travelling to Enniskillen in order to strengthen three platoons they were engaging, that were engaged in patrolling the border. They had to change trains in Clonus, and when they were seated in the Enniskillen train, ready for departure, the incident began. Only six of the 18 carried rifles. Word had been sent out to the local IRA, and several of them, including their officer commanding, arrived at speed. A gunfight began in which the officer commanding and four specials were killed. <clears throat> the remaining constables were captured. The Irish Times Clonus correspondent wrote, Commandant Matt Fitzpatrick of Wattle Bridge and about 11 IRA men in uniform were on duty at the railway. When the train was about to depart, Fitzpatrick approached the carriage in which the B specials were seated and ordered them to put up their hands. Some of the men obeyed the order and the Commandant remarked that if the hands went up, there would be no shooting. A special left another compartment and fired at the commandant who was shot through the head. Rapid firing then took place from rifles, revolvers and a machine gun. The four specials killed were temporary sergeant W.K. Doherty from Derry City, Constable McMahon from Belfast, Constable J.A. Abraham from Ballina Mallard and Constable J. Lewis from Oma. Some of the specials were taken prisoner, while others escaped across the border. Those being held were released the following day and made their way to Enniskillen. The three prisoners under sentence of death in Derry Jail were reprieved by the Lord Lieutenant Fitz Allen on the 7th of February. They were Thomas McShay and Patrick Johnston of Bundoran and a prison warder, Patrick Leonard. On the 21st of February, the British released the Monaghan prisoners, to which the IRA responded by allowing the captured Unionists to go free, and the feared confrontation was therefore averted. Then I'm just going to mention the Petigo and Belique battle. The last battle of the War of Independence was fought in Petigo and Belique in late May, early June 1922, and almost six months after the treaty was signed, and shortly before the outbreak of the Civil War. It was the largest military engagement between Irish and British forces since the Easter Rising. It symbolised a final effort by Republicans to contest Britain's continued presence in Ireland and was the very last time that pro- and anti-treaty troops joined forces. There were 55 pro-treaty Free State troops and 31 anti-treaty IRA members involved. At that time, many IRA volunteers from Tyrone and Fermanagh, who had been forced to go on the run, had relocated to Petico and Belique to be ready to participate in Collins's planned Northern Offensive due to take place in May, June 1922. The offensive was designed to collapse the Stormont administration and force the British to renegotiate the treaty. The presence of Irish forces in the area drew the ire of the Unionist administration. On the 27th of May, about 100 B specials, led by Sir Basil Brooke, crossed Loch Erne in a pleasure steamer with a flotilla of small boats and landed near Belik. They marched to Maharamina Castle, and that's Maharamina Castle up there, about four miles from Belik, the residence of Catholic priest Father Lorcan O'Kiron, and ordered him to leave, which he did. O'Kiron was well known for his Republican sympathies. Brooks' men took up defensive positions there but soon realised their vulnerability to attack. They were forced by 30 IRA men to abandon the castle from where they retreated to Buck Island on Loch Erne. Throughout the following week, the Irish forces fought off a number of attacks 
from a combined force of B-Specials, RUC and later British soldiers. On the 31st of May, word of the battle reached Michael Collins, who was meeting Winston Churchill in London. Churchill was incensed and demanded to know if any Free State troops were involved. Collins denied that they were, and at that stage believed it. However, he continued to deny their involvement, even after he became aware of the facts when he returned to Dublin. Churchill ordered British forces based in Enniskillen, including artillery, to attack Irish positions in Pettigo and Balik. Hopelessly outnumbered, more than 60 members of the Irish force were evacuated from Pettico. By the 4th of June, Pettico was in the hands of the British, who then turned their attention to Balik. They shelled Balik Fort, which was soon evacuated by its IRA garrison. <coughs> All was over by the 8th of June. Those killed on the Irish side were Patrick Flood of Pettico, Bernard McCanny and William Carney of Drum Quinn, County Tyrone, and William Deasley, Drumore, County Tyrone. It is unknown how many died on the British side. Lee Modrier, who has written a, a history of um, Donegal, mainly in the War of Independence, observes that Collins believed the Irish force would be facing the special constabulary, but Churchill made the call to send in the military, which Collins had not anticipated. He noted that fewer than a hundred Irishmen in their teens and twenties managed to keep the British army at bay for almost a week. So now we're just going to move on to the Anglo-Irish Treaty, and I'm, only, I'm not going to deal with all the um, negotiations around that. I'm just going to deal with one aspect, and that's around Article 12. When negotiations began, a boundary commission formed part of the discussions. Arthur Griffiths reported confidently to Dublin that it would be a boundary commission to delimit the six county area so as to give us the districts in which we have a majority. Collins proposed that Tyrone, Fermanagh, more than half of Armagh, a great deal of Derry and a strip of Antrim would go with the authority they prefer. He was somehow left with the impression, which was nowhere to be found in the subsequent written agreement, that the Boundary Commission would deliver vast territorial tracts to the Free State. He believed what would remain in the North would not be viable, and that it would be forced, for economic reasons, to seek unity with the rest of Ireland. However, Kieran Rankin argues that Collins' belief was based on the misconception that mere physical size would determine the economic viability of the North. As it was not a separate state, its ultimate viability would be decided by Britain, regardless of size. The original text of Article 12 of the treaty uh, was very subtly altered by the British to the detriment of the Irish delegation with a selectively inserted clause. And the article with the new clause read as follows. That's the clause there. A commission shall be appointed by the British government to determine in accordance with the wishes of the inhabitants so far as may be compatible with economic and geographical conditions. That is the added clause. The boundaries between Northern Ireland and the rest of Ireland, etc. This wording suggests that the wishes of the inhabitants could be subordinated to other considerations and it was reinforced by the omission of, of provision for a plebiscite to determine local preferences. Arthur Griffith was warned that the clause was too vague and ambiguous and that a geographical unit should be specified, that a vote should be taken in this unit and the unit would automatically then come to the Free State or remain in the North according to the majority of the votes. Griffith was very anxious to sign the treaty and accepted the wording as it stood. 
Lloyd George had intensified the pressure on the Irish delegates with the threat of immediate and terrible war within three days if they refused to accept. <clears throat> Collins knew that the IRA was in no fit state to continue the war. The treaty was signed on the 6th of December 1921. Article 12 specified that three commissioners should be appointed, one by the Irish government, one by the Northern Ireland government, and one by the British government. And the British appointee would also serve as chairman. It crucially secured the signing of the treaty and it sustained the nationalist aspiration to remove partition. From a nationalist perspective, its, law, its flaws were as follows. The, um, the Northern Ireland Commissioner, Northern Ireland wasn't involved in the treaty, so they just refused to nominate a commissioner. There was no territorial framework, no, it, like a, a, an electoral division or a, a barony or whatever. Uh, there was no contingency for plebiscites, no date for the establishment of the Boundary Commission. It was going to be internal rather than international. It had little semblance of democratic credibility. Aggravating these flaws, the Free State Government imposed customs barriers that entrenched the existing border, be existing boundary, before the Commission had even been established. The failure to recognise these problems exposed the inexperience and naivety of the Irish delegation in placing their trust in a British government that had vast experience in negotiations of this kind, who had parsed every word of the article to their advantage. Collins and Craig met in January 22 to try to reach agreement on the future boundary. Their views, however, were so divergent that no such agreement could be reached. Craig said Collins showed him a map suggesting he had been promised almost half of Northern Ireland including the counties of Ferman and Tyrone, large parts of Antrim and Down, Derry City, Enniskillen and Newry. On the 16th of February 22, Churchill delivered his famous rhetorical speech in the House of Commons. On the dreary steeples of Ferman and Tyrone, emerging from the deluge of World War I with the integrity of their quarrel, <coughs> unaffected by the cataclysms of Europe. The speech was delivered in the context of the reading of the bill that would give effect to the treaty. Strong hints are to be found in that speech regarding his preferred outcome of the proposed Boundary Commission. He was also anxious that the treaty should come into force as soon as possible so that, quotation, the Republic can be disestablished and completely put aside, unquote. Collins regarded the treaty as a stepping stone to full unity, and in the early months of 1922, as we have seen, he was doing his utmost to destabilise the northern state. In August 1922, Collins complained in vain that Churchill intended to paint Tyrone and Fermanagh with a deep orange tint in anticipation of the Boundary Commission, and to try to defraud the people of the benefits of the treaty. Collins was killed only days later, which removed the only leader in the Irish government who had consistently made partition and the plight of northern nationalists a proactive concern. I'm just going to briefly mention here, before the setting up of the Boundary Commission, the Civil Authorities Special Powers Act, Northern Ireland, 1922. As soon as the Anglo-Irish Treaty was put into effect, the Special Powers Act was enacted on the 7th of April 1922 by the Northern Ireland Government. This act was regarded as one of the most draconian pieces of legislation ever passed in a liberal democracy. Many years later, Lord Cameron, in his 1969 report, <coughs> noted that the act's sweeping powers were seen by the nationalist population as a tool of unionist oppression. 
It was used throughout the whole tenure of the Northern Ireland Parliament up to its prorogation in March of 1972. It was initially presented as emergency legislation and had to be renewed annually. In 1928, however, it was renewed for five years and at the end of that period, in 1933, the Act was made permanent. Its powers included internment, flogging, curfew, the closure of roads, restrictions on flying the Irish tricolour, the power to prohibit inquests, uh, that was a power that prevented the investigation of illegal killings by the security forces, the closure of licensed premises and the introduction of stringent requirements for the possession of firearms, explosives and petrol. It also allowed for the banning of publications, newspapers, parades, meetings, the singing of rebel songs, particularly the soldier song, the wearing of the Easter lily, the wearing of uniforms, the erection of Republican monuments, and the congregation of individuals in camping areas. Events such as commemorations of the Easter Rising and the 1798 Rebellion were banned, as were St. Patrick's Day celebrations, the Minister for Home Affairs had virtually unlimited powers of search. So now we come to the Boundary Commission. And uh, at last it was established, having been delayed because of the Civil War and also because, um, as I mentioned, um, the Northern Ireland Government had refused to um, appoint uh, um, a commissioner and legislation had to be passed to allow for the British to appoint the Commissioner for Northern Ireland. But at last it was established. The British government appointed Richard Feetham um, from the Supreme Court of South Africa as chairman on the 5th of June 1924. Feetham was born in Wales, educated at Marlborough and Oxford. He was a lawyer, politician and judge. He served in the Second Boer War and remained in South Africa. The Northern Ireland government um, refused to nominate a commissioner and had no desire to change the boundary. And so Joseph Fisher then was appointed on the 24th of October 1924 as the Northern Ireland commissioner by the British government. He was born in Raffrey, County Down. He was educated in Belfast and Galway. <clears throat> he was a Belfast barrister and former editor of the Unionist Northern Whig newspaper. He was a staunch Unionist who had pri privately advocated the inclusion of Donegal into the Northern state. The Free State Government appointed Owen McNeill. He was born in Glenarm, County Antrim, and educated in St Malachy's College and Queen's College, Belfast. He had founded the Gaelic League with Douglas Hyde. He was an academic, a former university professor, and the serving minister for education, who, unlike the other two, had no legal training. His appointment as a commissioner was a disastrous mistake. Because of his duties as a minister, he was unable to devote the necessary time and energy to the commission. Joseph Lee argues that W.T. Cosgrave and his cabinet colleagues were aware of the forthcoming disaster and sought McNeil as a scapegoat. Shortly after the commission's establishment, the Free State Government made a submission underlining how the wishes of the inhabitants should be ascertained. The necessity for plebiscites was emphasised. Feetham argued that such wishes could be deduced from previous elections and the census results. The Free State objected on the grounds that the council areas had been reconfigured by Craig. The Free State's complaints fell on deaf ears as Feetham declared that a nationalist majority in a given area did not guarantee an alteration of the border. With regard to Fermanagh, there were submissions from the Nationalist Committee and the almost entirely Unionist Fermanagh County Council. The Nationalist Committee claimed that in view of the fact that the 1911 census on which Feetham had stated he was relying showed a Nationalist majority of 7,644, the county as a whole should be transferred to the Free State. 
The committee supported this claim by reference to the parliamentary election of 1918, in which 18,041 votes were given for the nationalist candidates as against 11,292 for unionist candidates. They also made reference to local government elections of 1920, when 52 nationalist members were elected and one urban, um, on the three district councils and one urban council against 48 unionist members. Fermanagh County Council, on the other hand, contended that the county should be wholly retained within Northern Ireland and that certain portions of the adjoining Free State should be transferred to Northern Ireland, notably the town of Petico, the bridge and slew estates at Balik, and the district electoral division of Drummully, County Monaghan. The Council claimed the 1911 census did not accurately represent the present proportion of Catholics and Protestants, as there had been a considerable Protestant migration into Fermanagh from the Free State. Several hundred Protestant families were submitted to the Commission, containing a total of 2,117 persons who had settled in the county since 1920. The Orange Order said they met the Commissioners as a matter of courtesy and informed them they did not recognise their powers. Captain Fife noted that the Northern Government was not bound to accept their findings, whereas the Free State was bound to do so and he also said the Orange men wanted East Donegal and North Monaghan. So when it, but of course they ignored the fact that not only the census, the 1918 election, the 1920 local elections and the 1921 election all showed um, nationalist majorities uh, in Fermanagh. When it came to writing their report the Boundary Commission recommended that territory be transferred to and from uh, Fermanagh. So now the total acreage to be transferred from Fermanagh to the Free State was 86,440 acres and 11,849 were to be taken from the Free State into Fermanagh. Now that uh, Boundary Commission report was not released until 1969 by the National Archives. This is the map and you can see that the areas that were, the black, is, uh, the black areas are what was to come from the Free State into Northern Ireland. And you can see a good slice of Donegal, East Donegal there in particular. You can see Drummully. Uh, and uh, then the other shaded one was what was to be transferred to the Free State. So before all of this could be implemented, on the 7th of November 1925, an English Conservative daily newspaper, The Morning Post, published leaked notes of the negotiations, including a draft map, which were largely accurate. The leak almost certainly came from Fisher, that is the Northern Ireland Commissioner. It caused panic in the Dublin Cabinet, which had never envisaged losing territory, particularly part of East Donegal to Northern Ireland. They should have been aware, though, of this possibility, because Churchill had hinted at such an outcome in his February 1922 speech. And they were surely informed that evidence had been gathered by the Commission from residents in Donegal, Cavan and Monaghan. The leak was a huge embarrassment to the Free State Government. There was outrage among the nationalist population that tracts of land were to be transferred to Northern Ireland. There was also consternation that Newry, which was 75% Catholic, was being retained within Northern Ireland. The entire treaty settlement hung in the balance. The issue was raised in Doyle Aaron on the 19th of November by two Donegal deputies, Dennis McCullough, who was an independent, and PJ McGoldrick from Cumann and Ale, which of course was the government party. McGoldrick said he voted for the treaty in January 22, mainly because it contained Article 12. 
he said many others did the same, and observed that the treaty would have had no possibility of being accepted if Article 12 had not been included. This view was echoed in the House of Lords by the Earl of Birkenhead on the 9th of December, when he declared that the treaty could never have been signed, it never would have been signed without Article 12. John White of the Farmers' Party chastised the government for binding themselves in advance to accept the decision of the Commission. Owen McNeill resigned from the Commission and from his Cabinet post <clears throat> on the 20th of November. Four days later, he made a statement in the Doyle, setting out the reasons for his resignation. He, he accused the Commission Chairman of having introduced a new condition into Article 12 that didn't appear in its terms. The Chairman had written, that's uh, Feetham, Northern Ireland must, when the boundaries have been determined, be recognisable as the same provincial entity. The changes made must not be so drastic as to destroy its identity or make it impossible for it to continue as a separate province of the UK with its own parliament and government for provincial affairs under the Government of Ireland Act. McNeill continued that this was a political consideration designed to override the wishes of the inhabitants. He said he had scrupulously observed the agreement to confidentiality which others had broken. By his own admission, he appears to have been a poor negotiator who failed to intervene at crucial times in seeking a more favourable outcome. The 1916 leader, Tom Clark, on the day before his execution in Kilmainham Jail, is alleged to have warned his wife to ensure that McNeil played no further part in national politics as he was a weak man. Now, of course, that was because he had called off the rising on Easter Sunday. Facing a no-confidence motion, Cosgrave headed to London the next day and was followed 48 hours later by a delegation. Kevin O'Higgins, Vice President and Minister for Justice, Ernest Blythe, Minister for Finance, John O'Byrne, Attorney General, and Dermot O'Hegarty, Secretary to the Executive Council. On the 3rd of December, an agreement was reached in the form of the Treaty Confirmation of Amending Agreement Act 1925 between the British, the Free State and the Northern Ireland governments that amended the Treaty of 1921. Other claims provided for the continued payments of land annuities to the British government and the transfer of Council of Ireland powers to the Northern Ireland government. The Free State secured some concessions regarding Article 5 of the Treaty, which committed the Free State to a share of the UK's national debt. Donegal Bacon argues that the amount the Free State was still liable to pay Britain annually was proportionally greater than the reparations that Germany had to pay under the Treaty of Versailles. From an Irish perspective, it was a very poor result. Kevin O'Higgins then sought concessions from Craig, the Northern Ireland Prime Minister. The agreement was debated, um, so that they were the um, concessions he sought. He sought um, the restoration of proportional, uh, proportional representation. He demanded the disbandment of the B specials, but uh, also um, equity and public appointments, the end of discrimination, but Craig refused to budge on all the proposals. The agreement was debated over three days in the Doyle, from the 7th, 10th of December 25, and one of Cosgrave's own Common and Yale members, Professor William McGuinness, was his main adversary. On the final day of the debate, McGuinness said, Now what were we talking about? all those years when we protested against the partition of our beloved country. He described the border in impassioned terms as this red scar branded across the face of our motherland. Even before the new agreement was voted on, 
Cosgrave and other cabinet members began to distance themselves from northern nationalists. A delegation had arrived seeking the hearing of their grievances before the die, but this was refused and they were sent away empty-handed. Cosgrave remarked caustically, an occasion may arise in the future in that some of our own citizens, for whom we have a direct responsibility, may have a case if a precedent has been made in respect of those for whom we act only as trustees. The vote on the new treaty was passed by 71 votes to 20. The 14 Labour Party members, four of the Common and Yale deputies, one Farmers Party member and one independent voted against the agreement. There were 14 abstentions. The 47 Sinn Féin deputies had refused to take their seats and despite the encouragement of Tom Johnson, the Labour Party leader, they refused to enter the Doyle to vote against the treaty. <clears throat> Even if they had, it would not have overturned the result. Northern nationalists had long suspected betrayal and now their worst fears were confirmed. The claim that they had been thrown to the wolves was echoed across the nationalist north and particularly in the newspapers of the border regions. This bitterness is reflected in a comment made by Keir Healy MP for South Fermanagh. John Redmond, he said, was driven from office for accepting partition for five years. Our present leaders have accepted it forever. Enda Staunton argues that the 1925 agreement denied the legitimacy of Ireland's independence struggle, recognised partition and abandoned Northern Catholics to decades of discrimination. Uh, just very finally, a sense of the bitterness and disillusionment is reflected in a letter to the Donegal Democrat from Eugene Coyle, the parish priest of Devonish, County Fermanagh. His letter is truly a cree de coeur. Writing in January 26, he claimed it was the first time in history that Irish men had consented to and signed a pact permanently cutting Ireland in two. At the same time, he wrote, they were betraying the nationalists of Ulster of whose rights they were guardians and trustees. This was done by three Irishmen, W.T. Cosgrave, Kevin O'Higgins and Ernest Blythe. Without consulting the Irish people, he proclaimed that John Redmond never did this, and certainly poor Collins and Griffith never did it, but our latter-day statesmen have done it. He expressed the view that the whole Boundary Commission, from start to finish, was a gigantic act of treachery and deception. He echoed many others when he wrote that without Article 12, there would not have been a treaty, that thousands of Irishmen had accepted the treaty only because it included Article 12. Now, um, just to tell you also, very last point, George Lunt, in an oral history project, Border Roads to Memories and Reconciliation. He, he did this in 19, he made this um, um, submission uh, in 2015. Now, George Lunt was the grandson of Sergeant William Gordon, the beast, one of the B specials shot dead by the IRA on the 21st of March 1921. <clears throat> he ended his contribution with this sentence, how much better for all it would have been if the border had never been put in place at all and the island of Ireland had never been divided. Thank you.